Your bags are packed and we're ready to go. It's time for another episode of Ask the Captain. Here we go. The first question is from Sniper Lou. Captain Steve, do you believe that uh, pilots are more or less stressed today than they would have been 30 years ago? Uh, many people think that it's only a matter of time before a pilot snaps. Well, I've been around for 30 years. I've been around flying airplanes for 42 years altogether. And so, I, you know, I don't think so. It's always been a stressful job on, on one level. In some ways, the technology has advanced to make the job in, on some level a little easier. But at the same time, you've got to monitor all the technology. So it's kind of a trade-off uh, in the long run. I think we're in this world where a lot of people are under a lot of pressure. I think it depends on what you feed on. You can get yourself all wound up about, you know, politics or, you know, you name it these days and anything can cause anybody to snap. Pilots are monitored for that. Uh, we kind of police each other. Like I said, I always ask my pilots, I've done this for 30 plus years. How are you doing today? And, you know, it's not just a casual question. It's a, it's a probative question. You know, everything okay at home? You, you know, are you guys ready to fly? Yep. And once I get that, that buy-in and everybody seems, you know, lighthearted and ready to go, great. Has there, have there been times where I didn't come to work because I thought my mind's not in it and I shouldn't be going flying? Absolutely. And so that's why they give us sick time and you ought to use that the right way. But, you know, the few times that you hear of a pilot snapping are very rare occasions, but they are very dramatic uh, because they make it onto the news and so forth. So, but you know, the answer to your question is, I don't think so. Not as much. Okay. Uh, next is Brendan uh, Freya. Uh, can you talk a little bit about something I'm even more terrified of, wind shear and microverse, and in particular, Delta Flight 191? I'm not, uh, I think Delta 191 is, uh, was a crash many years ago in at DFW. I, I'm just doing this off the top of my head. Uh, that one was a microburst that forced the airplane, I think it was an L-10-111, L-1011 down into the ground. Uh, the, the technology has advanced dramatically since those days. The microburst and wind shear alerting systems are very state-of-the-art. I get a warning now on my airplane. I don't have to just see the, the symptoms taking place in my airplane. I actually get an audible voice that says, a wind shear, wind shear, and I get a red uh, light on my dash that says wind shear. And at that point, it's mandatory for me to go into my wind shear avoidance procedure. So I slam the power up. We click the autopilot and auto throttle off, pull the airplane up and fly the airplane aggressively out of the situation. Um, with all that being said, uh, over the years, we've learned the hard way on some of these things. The most important thing is to not fly into a, a situation where you're going to encounter wind shear. And there are predictive wind shear systems on the airplane. So my airplane looks out ahead and it even predicts when it thinks I'm going to come into wind shear. Very nice and it works great. And we train on it every nine months when I go down for my simulator training. So we're kind of up to speed all the time in case we run into a wind shear condition. So should you be concerned? Yes. But the technology and the training is much better these days than it was back in the day. Good question. All right. I've got uh, Kristen uh, Irving, 4300. Is If the passengers on United 93 could have successfully taken back the controls from the terrorists, um, could they have landed somewhere where people could have walked away from it? If you're not familiar with the United 93, that was the last of the four airplanes that was hijacked on September 11th, 2001. It's the one that crashed into Shanksville, Pennsylvania, into a field. Um, the passengers were attempting to take back the cockpit. Uh, they did break into the cockpit, but I believe that the terrorist was, he was trying to, to get basically the people off of him. And he was kind of doing this with the yoke to get them to fly through the air and so forth. And uh, I think he ultimately just kind of rolled the airplane over and, and nosed it into the ground. Now, having said that, uh, if they had taken over the airplane, I, I would say this, it could have had a successful outcome had there been a commercial airline pilot in the back. I, I've heard rumors that there was, but I'm not, I, I don't know for sure that there was, I, you know, rumors are one thing. And, and, but if you know, let me know in the comments, because if there was actually a 757 pilot or even just a commercial airline pilot, um, they could have worked through, you know, getting that airplane back in the air and, and flying had they taken over from the terrorists, which would have been incredibly um, wonderful had that happened, but it, it didn't sadly. 
All right, uh, Lawman5511. Uh, Captain, who pays the hospital bill when a passenger is carted off the plane uh, to an ER? I think that's going to go under the passenger's insurance plan. I don't think the airline is going to pay for that. They're going to get you to where you need to go, but I think everything from the airplane to where you need to go and beyond is on you. So you better have good insurance uh, when you fly in an airplane or don't fly when you're sick and especially bring your meds with you. A lot of people come and they either pack their meds in their bags that get checked underneath. And uh, sometimes a flight goes longer than you expect it to. Don't be that far away from your meds. And uh, as far as hospital bills, I think it's on you. Yeah, good question. All right, uh, Red Cat 423. Uh, what creates turbulence, especially unexpected turbulence? Well, I've explained it before on this channel. Turbulence are nothing more than currents in the air. Like water will have currents and a, a lake is nice and smooth and a river, the, the water currents begin to pick up speed. And then you get to that point where you see white water on a river and it's, you know, it's turbulent and it's crashing into each other. Air is no different than that, except it's just not as dense as water. So is there a danger to the airplane? No, not really. The airplanes are so over-engineered uh, that they're going to withstand any sort of turbulence. It's just uncomfortable for us on the inside of the airplane. But you're going to have times where it's just as smooth as a lake. You're going to have times where the air currents start to pick up. Sometimes we fly through the jet stream. And sometimes the jet stream is converging. And boy, it really gets uh, turbulent. I try to avoid those areas. Any area of severe turbulence, I can't be. Uh, dispatched through that area and if I know about it I've got to go around it right and always 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 keep your seatbelt fastened when you're in your seat whether that sign is on or off you don't want to come flying out of that seat that's your only danger if you stay strapped in that seat no problems all right good question uh, Gene Nichols 6908 I was uh, I always have the question uh, regarding infants in arms that that's a good question right when it comes to the seatbelt sign do you just hold them a bit tighter <laughs> i was told we can't put the infant in the seat belt uh, alongside us uh, not a good idea to put them in the seat belt alongside you the best idea is to bring a car seat with you the best, best idea is to pay for a seat for your infant. Think about being in a car, right? You're going to put that infant in a car seat in the back. When they're really small, you're going to turn them backwards so that if you have a head-on collision, they can survive that even better. In the old days, when I was a kid, my mom used to sit with me uh, in, in her lap and she'd have her arms around me and there was a steel dashboard and a glass windshield in front of us and she wasn't even wearing a seatbelt. Well, that was no protection at all. It's the same in an airplane. You might be strapped in, but if you're trying to hold on to your child and there's severe turbulence, you're probably not going to be able to hold on to that child. And, and in, in addition to that, you're not going to hold on like this the whole time. At some point, you're going to want to have a drink or do something. You're just not going to do that. So again, what I'd say is bring a car seat, pay for a seat. That's the safest thing for an infant. Good question. All right. I've got 2009 Jeff Patriot. Captain Steve, how do waypoints get their names? I've always wanted to know this. Why is that one called Zesty? All right. The waypoints are the points that I fly to in the sky that create the highways to get me from point A to point B. They all have five letters. So Zesty is one of the points that you fly to. Um, they are always looking for five letter <laughs> identifiers for these things. They sometimes name them after people. Uh, when I come back into Charlotte, where I'm based, I almost always fly the Chesley 6 arrival. Chesley is named after Sully Sullenberger, I think is, uh, that's one of his names, right? He's got a bunch of names, Sully. There's another point, I think, called Sully. There's another point called Skiles, which is Jeff Skiles, who is the co-pilot. All the other names on that arrival are all the names of the flight attendants that were in the back of the airplane. They've abbreviated them into five letters. I'm sure there's a point Steve out there someplace, uh, whether it's spelled S-T-E-V-E -E or it's got two E's in it. Uh, I don't know. I've never flown to point Steve, but maybe somebody in the, the comments knows. But that's how waypoints are named. They're named after local celebrities. They're named after famous people. They're named after landmarks. They're named after whatever they can come up with to come up with five letters. Now you know. All right. Tiff's Horse 13. Uh, what do you do in the case of very overweight passengers that can barely buckle with the seatbelt extender and cannot walk quickly or unaided? Um, do you train for that? Well, not as a pilot. I don't train for that. That would be a flight attendant thing. There's all sorts of varieties of different passengers in the back. There are people that come on with a wheelchair and then miraculously they're healed by the time they get off the flight and they can just walk off. That's one category. 
The other is people that are in a wheelchair and they're either paraplegics, quadriplegics, and they have to have an aisle chair to get them down to their seat. Um, those folks are in their seat now for the duration of the flight. If they have to get off in a hurry, I think they're depending on one of two things. A spare flight attendant that can grab that person with the help of an able-bodied passenger. But for the most part, we're kind of leaning on able-bodied passengers and, and basically the goodwill of human beings. And if you see somebody that's on an airplane and they can't get out of that seat, I certainly am going to grab them. I'm going to grab them under one arm and I'm going to grab somebody else and say, get them under the other arm and come on, let's go. Let's get out of here. And it might not be pretty, but we're going to get that person off the airplane. Same with the elderly. As far as overweight folks go, again, you know, the same principles would apply there to helping people get off an airplane in a timely um, manner. But is it an issue? I, I don't know. All right. Uh, Benny Duchet, 2928. Why don't airplane seat belts have a shoulder strap? That's a good question. Uh, it wouldn't do much if you did. I have shoulder straps up in the front. Uh, I've got a five point restraint harness. I've got two here, two here, and one that comes up in the middle. Uh, kind of like a race car driver. They want to keep me strapped into my seat. Uh, with passengers in the back, I don't think it's going to make much of a difference. The basic reason that the seatbelt is there on your lap is to keep you from going straight up. The biggest danger is up here, the overhead. So if you hit real bad turbulence and you come flying out of your seat, the first thing that's going to hit is your head. That seatbelt keeps you safe from that. But as far as like a collision goes, I, I don't think a, a shoulder harness is going to do much for you. And it adds weight to the airplane. So those are off the top of my head, the reasons I think they don't have them. Right. Good question. CJ McLean uh, writes, I don't, uh, I thought a heavy plane had to burn or dump fuel before landing. Why wasn't it done here? All right. I think you're watching a particular video. And so let me just answer the question in general. Why do some airplanes dump fuel and others don't dump fuel? It's just, it's subjective to the captain and what the captain wants to do. You can land an airplane overweight. Uh, is it the best and most ideal? No. If the emergency you have is not that big a deal and you can spend some more time in the air and, and lower the weight of the aircraft, then it's better on the airframe. It makes for an easier landing. It's less likely that you're going to do any sort of damage to the airframe. And so some will take time and they will do that. For me, if I've lost an engine, I've got an engine failure and I'm down to one engine, I kind of don't want to mess around flying around any longer than I have to. I've got to get back to the airport. I've got to get the approach loaded in. I've got to get all my checklist done to make sure I don't create a secondary problem, but I'm probably not going to dump fuel. I'm probably going to land overweight. The other factor is this. You might be so heavy that the amount of runway that you need to come to a stop, you can't stop in that amount of runway at that airport that you're going to land in. Now you have to dump fuel. So you got to lighten the load of the airplane so that you shorten the effective distance of the runway for you to come to a full stop. So those are all factors that experience pilots. And again, there's no substitute for experience, my friends. You can't train experience. You can't buy experience. Experience happens over time. And the fact that this country is forcing pilots out at age 65 at their, at their most experienced level for no other reason than they have a birthday is just unthinkable to me. And uh, again, you know, they need to hear from you, our folks in Congress, about that. All right. So having said that, Good question. All right. Uh, the next one is uh, Nar W. Hall, DC. Steve, why don't airlines make the seatbelts crazy neon colors to make it easier for flight attendants to do their checks? Well, you know what? That's a great idea. You should send that suggestion in to the airlines and see what they think about making the seatbelts crazy neon colors. I'm not sure how it's going to make their job much easier, but hey, that's a great suggestion. I love it. All right. Uh, wonder, wander, Lisa. That's a bunch of letters. I can't even pronounce that. All right, here we go. Why does the yoke shake so much sometimes? Well, I don't know. If you're up in a cockpit and the yoke is shaking, that's uh, there's a thing called a stick shaker, which could be called yoke shaker. That's when the airplane's about to stall. So if you get into an angle of attack with the airplane, that the wing, the the air is being disrupted over the wings, the airplane will warn you about that before you stall. And the yoke that I'm holding on to, it'll actually shake like that. It's a mechanism that's put in place 
when I get to a certain airspeed and a certain airflow, it shakes the stick. So I know, hey, wait, I got a problem. It, it's like kind of wake up, buddy, right? And I, I, I instinctively want to nose the airplane over at that point because I need to get airflow back over those wings. So hopefully you've got the altitude to be able to do that. But that's what stick shaker is all about. I'm not sure that was your question, but uh, that's why uh, a yoke would shake. Anthony Walsh, 2196. Why does uh, ARF, and that's airport rescue firefighting equipment, park so close to the landing zone rather than closer to the end of the runway, knowing that the plane will need the extra distance to stop? Well, it's kind of a more of an art than a science of where they set up if there's an emergency airplane coming in. But let's say you've got a 10,000 foot runway. They're expecting an airplane to stop somewhere around the six to 7,000 foot level. If they go all the way to the end and the airplane stops in 4,000 feet, They've got to drive all the way down to meet you. If they park a little bit short and you go past them, they'll just get in behind you and follow you until you come to a full stop. So these guys have worked it out. The firefighters have worked it out over the years to get to the airplane the quickest. My guess is they're setting up so that they can get to you in the shortest distance possible. That's how I would do it. Um, Fargo's now 994. One thing that always worries me about turbulence is being hurt by other people who don't fasten their seatbelts. Well, that's a, that's a legit concern. Um, is that something you actually have, that can actually happen, or am I just worrying needlessly? No, it, it could happen. Uh, I've been in an airplane where people didn't strap in. We warned them with the seatbelt sign and with a PA to say, please strap in. We're going to go through some turbulence here. Four people didn't, and they did come flying out of their seats and they did land on other people. Um, how seriously could you get hurt by that? Probably not real bad, but um, it's annoying. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, could it be a minor injury? Yeah. And could it be unavoidable? Yeah. Keep your seatbelt fastened. That's the answer to that. Uh, uh, Roman A817 writes, is there no longer a distinction between turbulence and chop? You know, that's a good question because I've been wondering that myself. Uh, pilots will call uh, and they'll report chop or they'll report turbulence. And I think there actually is a technical definition between the difference between chop and turbulence, but it's also subjective to how it feels to you in the airplane, whether you're going through like light chop, moderate chop, uh, or you're going through light turbulence and moderate turbulence. I would say to me, the more severe it is, I start to call it turbulence. The less severe it is, I call it chop. But I'm probably pretty bad at this. I'm probably pretty lazy. I probably interchange the two terms and I shouldn't. But I've heard a lot of other pilots doing the same thing over the years. And uh, basically, uh, I listen for light, moderate, and severe. That's what I'm listening to. Whether they call it chop or turbulence, severe, yeah, absolutely got to avoid it. Moderate, I want to know so I can uh, maybe slow down a little bit or avoid that area. Light, you just have to deal with it and just uh, fly through it. But that's a great question. So folks, great questions this week. Absolutely wonderful questions. You made the cut this week and you might make the cut next time if you put the right comment in on the next episode of Ask the Captain.